I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. This is Small Boys Ministries. Uh, this is a class where we're going to discuss what we heard last week. And if you weren't here last week, you need to go online and listen to the testimony by Justin Sturr. It's an excellent testimony of the power and authority of Jesus Christ to set people free from bondage that is initiated by the enemy. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about is right here, depression and anxiety. <clears throat> and I told you last week that if you had friends that are struggling with depression and anxiety, they need to come and listen to what God has taught us about depression and anxiety. So if you have a friend that's struggling with deep depressions, minor depression and anxiety, do you need to call them and give them the link and tell them to get online so that they can find, uh, I don't care if they're on medicine, I don't care if they're off medicine, if they're struggling with it and, it, and they want to be set free from it, we will begin to show them how to do that in Jesus' holy name, okay? Let's begin with prayer. Father God, I ask in Jesus' name that you guide us and direct us and allow me to have the ability to teach the truth that you have taught in the lives of believers so they can live in freedom. And uh, we pray for George. He's sick, not able to be here. I just ask that you touch him and set him free. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you that are here in the house were here last night to hear Justin? Did you like him? Yes. Oh, yeah. Do you have questions about what Justin said or, or anything that he shared that you want some clarification? Anybody online that was there and heard it? I was waiting for a big discussion. No discussion. It was powerful. It was powerful. I agree with that. Okay. So we can agree that someone who has been involved in the kind of lifestyle that Justin was can be set free. Remember Justin's father? was a pastor, still is. He's not actively pastoring. He was a counselor. Um, he delivered people, but yet his son was, was possessed to an extensive amount of possession. So people who say to us, Christians cannot be possessed, do not understand the biblical concept, and I won't go into them tonight, about possession and it's, its effect on born-again Christians, okay? You can't, uh, if you want to argue, make an appointment, come and see me, I'll argue with you about it, okay? But I know one thing. I know many, many Christians who were um, possessed, harassed in their life that needed to be set free, and they were set Free. Okay. Had a young man in my office today who was set free, raised in the Christian home. He was set free. And, and if you want to hear his testimony, come, I'll get, put you in contact with him, and you will find out that he is free indeed. Right? The reason we give these testimonies is to show you the nature of God, the power of God, the authority of God, and the healing nature of God. That's the reason why we have these testimonies. So I, I missed some of it because I, I went and picked up Pope in the middle of it, but um, Justin was possessed. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. He was possessed. It, it explains a lot because the testimony was, was awesome. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. It was crazy awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We had an individual here that was not a Christian, yeah. and he believed that Justin wasn't just uh, in a fantasy world and thought he caught, 
killed a six-year-old. He believes he killed that six-year-old. Mm -hmm. This guy that was here. Mm -hmm. Because the explanation of what happened uh, was so profound to him that he thought that uh, Justin really did do this. Mm -hmm. There was no six-year-old missing. Okay. All right. Good question. Someone else? Yeah, you know. So he's he's completely delivered now, and you've been working with him, so you know firsthand. He is totally set free from the demonic forces that were oppressing. Okay. Be, and I've shared this in other teaching, but people can be set free and still have a weakness that they need to work through. Does Justin have weaknesses? Sure. sure. But he's nothing like what the testimony was talking about. Okay. All right. That's awesome. Thank you. And I'm not shuffling when I said he's got a weakness. That means he's really still possessed. No. There's a difference between having a weakness and continually being manipulated and controlled by arguments, strongholds. In possession. Okay. Good. Hey, Jim, keep asking. Those are good. Anyone else? All right, we're going to move to this right here depression and anxiety. Psychology calls it depression. And it means that a person emotionally cannot handle the circumstances in their life. And the reason, this is psychology. I'm gonna say it again, it's psychology saying this. Saying that psychology um, states that emotionally they cannot handle the pressure on, that they are under and that they need some medication to um, cause the chemicals that control you emotionally to become stabilized so that depression will go away, all right? What they don't tell you is that the chemicals that they give you do not take the depression away. It masks it so you can function, all right? And if, so, you, if there's somebody in your life who is struggling with anxiety and depression, And they're taking medication for it. Seven, eight years ago, I wouldn't say this publicly, but now I am absolutely sure it's true. If they're taking medication for anxiety and depression, it's not helping them get better. It only lets them function, and they do not function at the level God intended them to function. Okay. Any questions before I move on? The word depression indicates that a person is pressed down by something and they cannot function. All right. That's what depression. They're pressed down by something and they cannot function. There are a lot of people, 80% of people in the hospital, according to the American Medical Association, are there because they have a form of depression and it's causing physical illness, but 80% of them are in there because of that. Did you know that? It is an epidemic. You thought the pandemic was bad. The pandemic is nothing compared to depression in the world today. It does not happen just in civilized worlds. It happens in worlds that are not civilized. It happens everywhere. In deepest, darkest Amazon, Africa, China, everywhere. Russia, China. I said China, didn't I? United States, even, even in California. Okay. Especially. Especially. Especially in California. Yeah. It happens in communities that are cut off from large metropolitan 
citizen cities cities there it, it it's cut off you can be cut off from all of civilization civilization and still depression doesn't okay there are people who have never been depressed there are people who've been sad but we're talking about depression right so what is depression then depression is bondage bondage comes because of what uh, paul talks about in corinthians he says that uh, god has given us divine weapons over called arguments pretensions Pretensions argument. And the other one I can't remember. Anybody remember the third one? Strongholds. Strongholds, arguments, and pretensions. What's that? Strongholds, arguments, and pretensions. Strongholds. Good word. Strongholds. I just said it louder than her. <laughs> so depression are strongholds, arguments, and pretensions that are undealt with either because a person is unsaved or because a saved person does not know how to deal with stronghold arguments. And, uh, pretension. Okay. So that's what this is. Depression is a bondage. So what do you tell a person that's causing their depression? Can you still see it on there? Yes. Any questions online? Three things that cause depression. Anger. God never designed the human being to live in anger over a long period of time. We live in a society today that anger is promoted in many different ways. Relationships, job, uh, a job that you have, a task that you have, marriage relationship, and all of these, all of this anger has to do with the inability to forgive. Okay. So if you are an angry person and you're that way for a long period of time, your emotions will, will no longer be able to produce within your body the hormone that helps you deal with anger. What do I mean? Well, there are glands that produce hormones. And if I'm constantly dealing with anger, whether the anger is on the surface or whether it is uh, pushed back behind and set on the back burner, suppressed. So anger can be out in the open or it can be suppressed. If I'm a, a perfectionist and I don't want anybody to know that I'm anger, I'll suppress it and I'll keep it there, and my gland will begin to dysfunction, and the gland won't work. It doesn't produce the hormone. My, my anger will get stronger. It opens the door then for arguments, pretensions, and struggles. That's what anger does. It is a base. Yes. yes. Who said yes? Sam, Sam. Okay. It is a base in our life that keeps us from seeing people, situations, and circumstances the way God wants us to view them. Even if those circumstances and situations hurt us. Anger will not let us see them the way God wants us to. We are unable to see them clearly. Okay?
Question. So you said long term uh, exposure to anger. There is some anger that's justified. And, and I believe scripture supports that where God gets angry, certainly at the Israelites. But, but he also teaches us when we have justified anger that we need to deal with it before the sun goes down. Yeah. Or it will open up a boycott, a, which, a place for, for, for evil to live. Oikos? Oikos Amen. is a Greek Amen. word for house. That's like Greek yogurt, yeah. Yes, Greek yogurt. Yeah. <laughs> How does he know that? <laughs> yeah, oikos. Yeah, oikos, okay. That's, um, the word means house. That's amazing. Okay. Okay. It says in James chapter 4, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give it a, 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 a foothold, which is oikos, okay. meaning a house to live in. Let the devil live in a house. So over long periods of time, that will happen. And the longer you leave it unattended to, guess what happens? The stronger the anger in the, in the uh, uh, stronghold gets in your life. Gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Okay. We can't just smite people like he did. What's that? We can't just smite people like he did. If you do, you have to ask God to forgive you afterwards. Okay. <laughs> but don't smite him with a sword or a gun. No. Don't take any ears. Nope. Don't take any ears. Sam had, Sam had a really good question. What if you can't stop being angry? The reason you, you can't stop being angry is because the Lord is not the Lord is not the Lord of your emotions. You are the Lord of your emotions. And you are in control and you decide what is right and wrong and not God. Okay. Good question, Sam. So we're really at that point talking about a sin, a sin of unforgiveness. He probably heard that. Didn't he? Okay. Something else you want to say about anger? Anger left untreated begins to then cause a root of bitterness. So the other reason you cannot stop being angry is because bitterness has taken the place of the anger and it's a stronger version of anger. Bitterness has to do with judgment. Like you, you said, that person is this way. That person is that way. And, and so bitterness, as it says in Hebrew, becomes a root. And so then you have to deal with the anger and you have to deal with the bitterness. This is important to teach your children not to be angry and bitter. Your children need to learn if you do not share, if you do not teach your children to be uh, forgiving and asking God to heal and know how that happened and to trust God in the situation where the pain was occurred, your children will grow up and the older they get, the harder it is to overcome. But God can overcome. Other questions? That's why more and more people are struggling with uh, depression. That's why more and more people are on medicine, older people. Older people, more and more are taking medicine because of this. Now, what's the second thing that causes depression? You thought that was enough, didn't you? <laughs> the second one is fear.
Here's now I want to tell you something. Fear can work in conjunction with anger. And if you are an angry, depressed person, I guarantee you there is fear right behind it. Because anger means if somebody's hurt you in some way and you are now afraid that they are going to hurt you again in another way or somebody else will the same way hurt you. And so it perpetuates the anger and the fear grows out of it. Okay. Somebody hurts you, you don't want to be hurt again, and you get afraid that they will, and then your life has two things that your emotions are dealing with. Your glands overwork even more. We can detect by science if your glands are overworked. But science cannot detect the damage that does that does that, that does to you spiritually. He cannot detect it. I don't care what tests they take. <clears throat> okay, somebody, name a fear other than fear. Fear of rejection. Failure. Fear of failure, fear of rejection. Unknown. Abandonment. Unknown. Unknown fear. Good one. Public speaking. <laughs> Public speaking. Public speaking. I know pastors that are paralyzed because of that fear. Someone else. Man. Fear of man. Fear of women. Financial ruin. Fear of financial ruin. Is there anybody else on there but Sam? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Fear, of, fear of sickness. Fear of sickness. Thank you, Janice. Who else? What else? Other other fear. Fear of being getting hit by a car. Fear of drowning. Fear of scuba diving. Fear of drowning in in a whatever. There are different fears of drowning. Yeah. Acrophobia. You know. Fear, fear of what? Yeah. Acro. What is it? Acrophobia. What is it? Ara arachnophobia. Arachnophobia. <laughs> that too. Fear of spiders. Spider. Fear of insects. Fear of bees, fear of dying from the bees. Do you know we produce so much fear in our children? Mice. Fear of mice. <laughs> snakes. Black snakes. That's just that's just enmity. That's just in you. That's just enmity. Enmity. <laughs> Self-preservation. Yes. I don't know. What what else? What other kind of fear? Fear of being found out. Fear of being found out. Fear of the truth. Fear of the truth. Fear that something's going to happen to your child. Fear that you will lose a family member slash child. Fear of death. Fear of hell. Fear of God. Fear of Jesus. Why do I know all these? What are the fears? So. Fears that the balloons were here last week. <laughs> <laughs> Fear of clowns. Mm -hmm. That did not exist in the 50s. Who did that to, to kids? I have no idea. Stephen King. Fear of the dark. Fear of sleeping. Is this a big problem? And people can become depressed with any any of those fears. They can have bondage because of it. It can drive anxiety too. Well, anxiety is fear in process. And someone called me yesterday and they like God is taking them through a change in their life, a big change. It's it's huge. Uh, they're getting out of a uh, out of bondage in walking in life, and uh, they 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 talked to me about what was going on, and I said, "What's going on here is that 
you're afraid you will have to live in this bondage for the rest of your life, and that's a lie from hell. Mm -hmm. And that makes you anxious. He was anxious. And I said, you, you have to ask God to forgive you for living in that fear and then to transform you to live in the truth of God. Now, that requires that you trust God in the change of your life. He goes, you're right. I did not have to lecture. Once God let him know the truth, and it was not me, God, he said, you're right. That's what's going on. He says, now, now I feel like tomorrow is going to set me free. Yeah. Wow. So depression is bondage. It keeps you from walking in the truth of the living God. Okay. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Questions? Any other questions? Comments? You can ask some, Victoria. We won't be upset. She's gone. She's gone. <laughs> yeah. We didn't. We took too long. <laughs> What do I hear? I hear noise. Sam. Somebody in the background. Somebody in the background. Somebody's television is on. I'm uh, listening to a Zoom. Jeopardy. <laughs> huh? It's Jeopardy. Jeopardy. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, it's Will Fortune. Sorry. <laughs> Questions about <laughs> fear. So forgiveness is the cure for anger and ensuring you don't have a root of bitterness. Prayer and blank is the cure for fear. Fear is recognizing the fear. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 18 and 19, it says that Jesus gives us authority over all, gives us power over all the enemy. And so God endows in believers. This is a good question, Jim. God endows believers with authority. Okay. And so when I realize that there is fear that has taken a hold of my life, I I ask God exactly what the fear is. Identify the fear. If you are struggling asking God what the fear is, go to a legitimate, write legitimate in big words or letters, a legitimate, mature Christian, a legitimate, mature Christian, and ask them what it is in their life, what fear is functioning in their life right now. You may not know, that's fine. Don't be upset if you don't. Find a legitimate Christian. And if you cannot find one in your life, get a hold of Kathy. Call Kathy's phone number, and we will put you in, in touch with a legitimate, mature Christian, and they will discuss your fear they will tell you what the fear is. When you are aware of the fear, you take that authority which is endowed in you by the Lord Jesus Christ over that fear. That authority has a cleansing product called the truth. Okay? He said, when I know the truth, the truth shall set me free. So you say to that fear, Name a fear. I don't care what the hardest fear you can think of. Dying. Dying. You say, Lord God, I am afraid of dying. I renounce the fear of dying in Jesus' name. I renounce the fear of dying in Jesus' name. Be gone and fill me with your Holy Spirit where it once was.
questions? Because I have something to add to it. Questions about that? No, that scripture is awesome, though. Luke 10 19. There's another one uh, in the gospel. Do you have to... uh, as, soon as, you, as soon as you get it done. Is he, is he speaking in tongues? I'm sorry. <laughs> as soon as you guys are done with whatever you're saying, we have a question online. I'm done. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right. Trust in God and he will help you come. Uh, help you can also be the antidote to fear. Right now I'm speaking. No, <laughs> Trust in God. Trust in God that he will, will help, help you, you and you can, and he can be the antidote to your fear. Trust Trust is essential. Trust is essential in the activation of the authority. If you do not trust God, you are only saying words in hopes that what you said will set the person free. Trust is essential, but you need to take authority because God commands us to take authority over our enemy. Okay. What, what is the likelihood of a non-believer absorbing and taking the sin? Uh, whatever Jesus wants. Yeah, Ab absolutely. Whatever Je if Jesus wants this person to know it, yeah, he will give them knowledge, spiritual knowledge. Absolutely. Okay. That's between God and that person. That, that's right. That's I'm right. not a theological uh, demagogue. No. Theological demon. I gotta, I gotta Google that. My picture is right there. <laughs> and it says not. not. This guy is not a theological demon. I don't know what people, but there's a lot of fun in this. It is fun. If you have trouble, if you have done the steps that we've talked about and, and the fear does not go away, if it's paralyzing you, then call Kathy and ask to speak to somebody, okay? And we'll set you up with someone because anybody we set you up with will walk, probably talk about you, talk to you about why you're afraid God won't do what you ask. Okay? There's another fear there. Two fears together become powerful in the practical application of a person's life. Okay. Okay. Does anybody know what the third reason for depression is? It's right down here. See it? <laughs> You okay, Donna? Can't see what it says. Is it? Yeah, I read that yet. What's that? I read that. So, no. Okay. Thanks. Camilla said sin. Sin? Camilla, so glad to see you. God bless you. That, that's a, a good try. Un unrenounced sin. You. That's a good try. And she says hi as well. <laughs> it is guilt. <laughs> Well, why did they go ooh? Because <laughs> we all felt it. Now, Camilla's correct that, that unconfessed sin can cause depression. Um, but these are the three things that work in tandem together that can cause clinical depression. Okay. Um, Guilt. You spell that right. G U G U U I L T. <laughs> that does, it doesn't look like guilt, but it is. And I don't feel guilty for doing it. Any question before we move on to guilt? Guilt has to do with lies. So guilt has to do with lies. The farther down the page I go, the worse I get. Okay.
You are always thinking that what you do is wrong or you will fail, which also ties in with what? Oops. With fear. Okay. See, they work in tandem. Guilt is always afraid that you'll do something wrong or something you'll fail at, or that, for example, no one will ever love me because I've been invited or uh, abandoned all my life. You see how they work together? No, uh, no one will respect me. You're guilty because you're inferior. You're unloved. You follow what we're talking about, Gil? You're afraid to do something because if you do it, either they won't like it or you're felt. Guilt can be towards yourself. You can feel guilty because you cannot accomplish what you need to, like clean the house for a woman, do the job right as a man, or the job right as a woman. I should have. I couldn't. Some of you listening now who have even been set free by the Lord Jesus Christ are still struggling with guilt. And it will immobilize you. It will keep you from growing in Christ. It will keep you from engaging in your spousal relationship in a healthy way, or it will keep you from doing whatever it is you need to do, because guilt will do that. It is a stronghold that causes depression. Sam asked, and then there is also uh, fear or guilt where you hurt another person and you feel guilty. Yep. Legalism in churches can make people feel guilty to the point that they will feel ashamed to even come to church. Legalism does this. And churches make us feel guilty in a lot of different ways. If you do not give 10%, you're outside of God's will. What you give to God is nobody's business to God's. So, oh, they're going to kick me out of church without <laughs> saying that. It's between you and God. God knows your circumstances. He knows your money. He knows your bills. He knows your income. He knows your circumstances. God does not shame people. Shaming people makes them feel guilty. Sam is asking if Calvinism causes depression. Amen. If Calvinism causes depression. When Calvinism is taught in a legalistic way, it can cause depression. It can cause confusion, mental frustration, depression, anxiety. Yes, sir. Question so far. Catholic Church could cause depression too, Sam. That's true. <laughs> Where did all these Calvinists come from? <laughs> Geneva. <laughs> that's where that's where it was. It really started with Augustine in the Catholic Church. Matter of fact. They call him the father 
of the of that move. Go ahead and ask it. Will Calvinists go to heaven if they know Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Will United Brother if they know Jesus Christ? Absolutely. How about Pentecostals? Not Pentecostals. <laughs> Charismatic. Not. If they know Jesus Christ, they will go to heaven. That's between them and God. No. We're not. We are not. What was it I called myself? A theological demagogue. I am not a theological <laughs> demagogue. God is God. They're just going to be in their own little roped off section, right? <laughs> right. You're asking me to yeah. say yes. <laughs> I do not know if God made growth in heaven. <laughs> Good answer. Okay, so we have anger that is along with bitterness, and we've got fear that we've got guilt. Okay, if you live with a history of guilt, you need to understand this and don't. Go away without hearing this. If you have lived in guilt or depression for years and years and years and years, I know people, I've set people free who've lived in guilt for 20, 30, 40 years. Okay? They spent enough money on uh, medicine to uh, sink a battleship. I'm not, it, it's... You can be set free. But you need to learn to repent. Because there are times that I am angry and it's a sin, as Camille talked about a little bit. And that sin needs to be repented of because if I renounce anger over and over and over again, but I'm living in the sin of anger, and I'm not asked God to forgive me for my anger because I am justified in my anger and my thinking. Okay? I'm justified in my anger. I'm not going to repent of it. I'm going to endorse it. I'm going to create an atmosphere for it to grow. And so this anger will perpetuate itself in you and keep you depressed. Okay. Same way with fear. I could be afraid and it's a sin. I, I was going to ask, when, when does fear and guilt, when does that become a sin? Um, I'm afraid God does not love me. People have fear that God doesn't love me. That's a sin. God loves you. Um, when somebody says, I love you, just like God, when I say, I, I love you, if somebody says, I love you, and you don't believe them, and you're still afraid, that's a sin. Guilt, guilt is an ugly, horrible thing. It's like, it's like shame incarnate. And but if I do not trust God to set me free from my guilt, then that's a sin. I deserve, this is what gets, guilt says, he talks to you. You deserve rejection. You deserve this problem. You deserve this set of circumstances. And you don't ask God to forgive you. That, that perpetuates it. Okay? <coughs> Sam said that false guilt is also so often used to control people. Often? <laughs> I disagree. Always. <laughs> it always. False guilt, guilt is nothing but manipulation and control. All right, let's say you're let's say that you're depressed. Okay. It's a little depression, it's a big depression. The first thing you do is you ask Jesus Christ what's functioning in you. Fear slash guilt, uh, anger, or bitterness. You ask God. 
This is why I tell you over and over again, now this is the third semester, you must hear God's voice. Your opinion about your dilemma is worthless to you. Did you hear that? Your opinion about yourself is worthless to you. That's why you need to learn how to hear God's voice. If you pray for two weeks and you are confused about what's going on in your life with depression, call Kathy. She'll set you up an appointment with somebody and we will pray with you and find out what your dilemma is, okay? If you can hear God's voice, let me tell you what, when you ask him what's going on, he will tell you. Don't stop there. Say, is there anything else? Oh, I'm afraid of dogs. Okay, I'm afraid of dogs. Didn't they do? But you're afraid of being bitten by a dog. There's something more to it. You follow what I'm saying? You ask God what it is, and then when he identifies the combination, it could be one or all of these. When he, when you figure out what it is, then you take authority. Don't be afraid. Don't so listen to the law. When God reveals it to you, not when you figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. Did I say that? Yeah. I'm sorry, Jim. No, you're forgiven. <laughs> yeah, no problems. No, you're right. When, when I figure it out, then I take authority. Don't start taking authority and think you're unworthy. That's like a dog denying he's a dog. It is naturally ours as a born-again Christian to have authority that is ours given to us by the Lord God. My dog has never come up to me and say, am I a dog? <laughs> am I a dog? And a cat never comes and asks anyhow. So they just know they're a cat. You're a Christian. The devil wants you to believe you have no power and authority in your life that God would give to you. And, and if you start to think that, he will say, you're not worth that power and authority. The power company never comes out to look at your house to see if it's a two-bedroom or a four-bedroom whether it is worth 500000 or a million and a half dollars, they will send the power to any house. Right? So I'm a dumpy house with one leg. He sends me power. Right? Isn't that a neat illustration? I didn't think that. <coughs> Then, then you take the authority. I renounce depression in Jesus' name. I renounce the anger in Jesus' name. I renounce the guilt in Jesus' name. Remove it from me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. If you want to learn spiritual warfare with other people, working with depression is the quickest way. It's not complicated. But I do want to tell you a secret. When people live in long-term depression, there are other strongholds. Because undealt with strongholds invites other strongholds to be developed. Write that down. Got it?
That's it. I'm done tonight. Somebody got a question? I need questions to help me here. The um, you're you're tying depression and anxiety together. They're so close. Yeah, they are so close. Because I see anxiety as like fear, kind of un unchecked, un like uncontrolled. Yes, sir. Very good definition. All right. Anxiety is that. Way. But but it's like depression graduated into overdrive. And and some fear is healthy, like some anger is healthy. God gave us the emotion of fear in a healthy way. God gave us, for example, he gave us uh, uh, love in a healthy way. And then it can be perverted. Yes, these are these are mis emotions that God gives us. Yes. But I can't see any use for guilt. Like what? What is okay? What, uh, okay, <laughs> yeah. Let's get rid of it. Yeah, I, I mean, anger definitely fear. Yes, it can save your life, right? Like, especially young boys. Guilt, <laughs> guilt will put you in the hospital. But yeah. guilt, but yes. Like, say you cheated on the test, and then you felt guilty. Yeah. It's so if you had the guilt, then you would realize I need to confess that I cheated on your test. Otherwise, you would just be a sociopath and be like, who cares? Okay, so guilt, guilt <laughs> can drive remorse and remorse. There's something, it's conviction. Yeah, that you did something wrong. Okay, okay, that's good. It's guilt is useless. Huh? Guilt is useless. If you have guilt, it's no use. Okay, so conviction <coughs> is useful. Being convicted, convicted of, of the Holy Spirit is not guilt. Right. Conviction is a message from God yeah. to somebody he loves that there needs to be transformation. Okay. That's what conviction is. Can you be convicted if you're not saved? Same thing. Yeah. So an unsaved person who cheated on a test that gets convicted, but they're going to interpret it as guilt, not right. conviction. That's okay. God will teach him later. <laughs> Yeah. God works in spite of us, not because. When there are there any questions on Zoom? They were making the same comments about conviction versus. Hey, ahead of us. Mm -hmm. They were. No, we were <laughs> Alongside. Anything else? Father God, in Jesus' name. Don't hang up zoo people. It's something I gotta say. Don't hang up. Father God, in Jesus' name, bless these people and let them recognize the depression that they have that is and and how to deal with it. Teach them. If they don't, if they struggle with it, don't know how, let them get in hold of somebody who's mature and responsible in Christ to help them. If they don't know of anybody, Lord, let them get in contact with us. So we can get them in contact with some in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Next Tuesday, next Monday night, there is no class except those people who have re received an invitation for some planning and some change for a small voice ministry. Okay. If you are in Zoom. You, you will get it if you're supposed to come and you are to come. I know that it may be inconvenient, but it's important that you be here. We are providing food at 630 and we will enjoy at six o'clock. They changed the time no. at six o'clock. The meeting will start at six o'clock. We'll eat. And then we will talk about the changes that, that God is putting forth for this ministry. Okay? I'm not moving away for some of you who's worried. This has to do with how we can reach people for Jesus Christ. Okay? Thank you all. If you have questions about that, guess who you call? <laughs> Kathy. All right? Thank you all. God bless you. Have a good night. Thank you.